Good evening, everyone. This is Susan Reynolds with Friends for Survival. Thank you so much for joining us in our webinar this evening. It is Tuesday, March 10th, and I'd like to introduce Marilyn Koenig, our Executive Director. Thank you, Susan. I, and um, my name is Marilyn Koenig, and it's um, a pleasure to be um, on this webinar with you this evening. And I really welcome every single one of you that has already clicked in and anybody in the future that hopefully this evening yet may may join us um we're we're this is our third webinar so we this was our effort to kind of bring um our services more to the forefront by using social media and we hope that this is helpful to you we really would appreciate you kind of giving us comments and feedback uh, later on, wait till after today though, wait till after we finish this one, at least tonight. And I want to introduce our speaker tonight. Kelly Holstrom has been uh, a member of our, or I shouldn't say, we're not really members, we're part of, we're part of the family of Friends for Survival. She has been involved with us and volunteering with us for, I think, uh, three, four years, maybe now about yeah, that. Yeah, probably four. Yeah, about four years, and mm -hmm. she is also the president of our board of directors. So I am thrilled to have her here and sharing. And we're all doing this from our own homes on this webinar. We're not in some central place, in case you didn't, you know. Um, if you're like me, I haven't done enough webinars to really understand all of it. But Kelly is here from her office. Uh, up in the, the foothills of Sacramento, and we are delighted. She's going to talk a little bit about her loss and, and her journey and offer, you know, what things helped her and how she has been coping. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly and go for it, girl. Oh, great. Thanks, Marilyn. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kelly, and thank you for that introduction, Marilyn. Um, I have been a part of Friends for Survival for, for quite some time. Um, and so what I thought we would do tonight is I'll share my story, uh, what's happened with me. Part of this webinar series is so that we can um, get some of the great sharing and, and um, help and understanding that normally comes in our in our face-to-face -face peer support meetings. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can make those more accessible to more people. And uh, we came up with this idea of the webinars. So we hope that they're helpful for you. Um, specifically, the webinar was a, was a particularly um, attractive way to, to talk about things from my perspective as um, not only a single parent, but now an only parent, right? So I know it's particularly hard when uh, it's hard to go to meetings anyway, because it, it doesn't always seem like something that you want to do, even though I think they are tremendously helpful for many, many people. Um, but then you add in some of those other things, like, at least for me, I had to find, you know, um, a babysitter, and I had to have money to pay that babysitter, and then I'd have to drive and go and, and all that. So um, hopefully some of you who are on tonight might, you know, um, relate to that. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll tell you my story. And I am very much an open book. Uh, that's part of my philosophy of how things have gotten much, much better in my life. Um, so please, if you have questions, I know Susan was, was talking about that at the beginning, feel free, you can type them in. Um, you can also you know, send an email afterwards. I, I can respond to emails privately as well. But if you have something that you'd like to ask um, that's appropriate for the group, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. So <clears throat> um, I lost my husband, Travis, to suicide uh, almost eight years ago now. It was May of 2012. And um, in fact, it was Mother's Day of um, May of 2012. It happened to fall on Mother's Day that year. So I have uh, a little bit of, of that double whammy in, in grief in that both M May 12th is a very difficult day for me and many years Mother's Day is also a really difficult um, time for me. Now, eight years later, or uh, over seven years later, I guess, um, I'm in a much, much better spot. And, and so that's some of the stuff I wanna share with you. 
Um, maybe I'll start this out so it doesn't all just seem like such a downer to, to tell you a little bit about our success right now. Um, I'm doing really, really well. I have a great job. Um, I spend a lot of time doing the things I love to do, being outside, gardening, spending time with my kids. I have two very happy, well-adjusted kids. They got their report cards last week. They both did great. You know, they play sports, they have friends. Um, the fact that their father is not living, it is not something um, that defines their life. It is a part of their life and it's an important part. And it's something that we're very open about, but it has not defined their life in a negative way. We, we and I in particular have, have refused to let that be part of our story. So here's our actual story. Um, May 12th of 2012, um, my uh, daughter, our daughter's three and a half, and I had just had our son, he was nine weeks old. Travis was out of town um, when he uh, died by suicide. And I got that, that information via a phone call when I was driving my car with the kids. And um, it's not the kind of thing that anyone should just, you know, tell you over the phone. It was terrible. Um, I did not crash the car, <laughs> thankfully. Um, I got us home. I got everybody into the house. Um, I called my friend and I said, hey, uh, you have to come over here, like right now. Uh, I, I called my, my very good friend who I've known since I was a kid and who uh, coincidentally only lived about 10 minutes from me. And she's like, oh yeah, cool. You know, I'll, I could be there within a half hour. And I said, no, no, it, it's not that kind of thing. Um, and I told her what happened and I said, I need you to come here right now. And she was at my house with, within, I don't know, four minutes. <laughs> she lived six minutes away and she was there probably in four minutes. Um, and then I started having to make the phone calls and tell people. That was a very, very hard thing to do. Um, and I'm sure if any of you have had to do that same sort of thing, it, it, uh, it in and of itself is traumatizing. So you just have these sort of shocks on top of shocks on top of shocks. Um, what the situation that we were in at that time, uh, Travis was um, 39 years old when he died. He was a funny and bright man. He really, really loved his kids. Um, he has an older daughter who lived with us at the time, uh, about three quarters of the time. She, she was at our house most of the time. And um, so when he died, we also lost most of our time with her. So we had a lot of things really change for us all at once on that day. Um, you know, when things first happened, there, there were so many questions not only just from me, but, but from his friends and from his family. And, and, you know, a lot of people wanted to know why, and they were looking for answers from me um, because they, you know, they couldn't get an answer from him. And um, honestly, the thing that I've come to realize after a lot of time is that, um, you know, people's, conscious and logical brain, my brain and your brains, are really generally not going to be able to make sense of the why. Even if, if perhaps we were told a why, I don't think that there's any logical thing that would explain to me the full situation in a way that I could fully comprehend it. And so um, it took me time, certainly, to figure out um, that the first thing was to figure out that I was in shock, you know, um, I was home, I, I was on maternity leave from my job. Uh, I had to go back to work pretty quickly because, um, you know, I had to have an income. 
And the people at my work could not have been more supportive. They were tremendously supportive and helpful. However, I, I mean, really, I was not in a space to be making big decisions and to um, really do the kind of job that I needed to do there. So I, I hung in onto it and I did it and I, and I came through it and actually within the next two years, I'd had um, one of my most successful years ever at my job, but um, it took a lot of hard work. And part of the work that I did was deciding to get help. So for me, um, getting help meant a couple of things. One, one is just, you know, personal therapy, talking to people, finding things out. Another thing was making some decisions for my kids. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then another thing was finding friends for survival. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I am battling a little bit of a cold, so I might have to have a drink of water here in a second. So um, I felt tremendously angry when Travis died. Um, that was probably the overwhelming. Like I felt like I did not plan for my life to turn out this way. It, it, you know, um, I was angry with him. Um, I was angry at the people who were bad drivers, you know, it didn't really matter what it was about. I was angry. Um, so that was really the first thing that had to be prioritized to be, you know, um, worked through. And so I also, like I said, since, since our son was so small, he was an infant. I was fortunate enough that, you know, my mom moved into my house for like two months. Because that, you know, that's what we needed. And I will forever be grateful to her and my dad. My dad stayed at their house and took care of all that stuff. And, you know, my mom moved in with us and helped me take care of the baby and let me be able to go back to work and, you know, fed us and did laundry and all those things that um, can really stop you in your tracks when you're in that tremendous, tremendous kind of fog of grief. Um, so that was an amazing help. Another thing was, um, I made a decision about my kids and it was this, I decided that the stability and happiness were the two most important things for success for my children in their lives. So every single thing I did after that point always went towards that kind of guiding principle or North Star or whatever you want to call it. So when my job said, hey, you're doing so great, we want you to, you know, be a senior director and move to New Jersey, I thought about, you know, that would be good for my career. Um, and that was years later, right? But what does that mean for my kids? Who do they have for a support system? Who are their people? Will my parents, who at this point have become a very involved um, set of, of stability and, and comfort and, um, you know, in some cases kind of parenting for them, what does that do moving across the country? The answer is no thank you for the job opportunity. I will be staying where I'm at. It's the best thing for my kids, you know. Um, one of the other things that I did is uh, at Friends for Survival, I went to that meeting. The first meeting I went to, the first few meetings I went to, actually, I don't think I talked very much, um, which is <laughs> unusual for me. Uh, I, I think I sat there and I listened and I probably looked like a deer in the headlights. Um, but I noticed a couple of things. At first, it was a little off-putting, honestly. Um, the The first kind of thing I noticed was I would come to the meeting and there would be these people and there's like probably 35 people at some of these meetings and people would come in and they'd give each other these hugs and they'd say, Oh, hi, it's great to see you. And, the, and, and I'm thinking like my world just blew up and, and how, why is everyone not sad? I was so sad. You know, I was sad and angry. That's a bad difficult combination 
although it's very real, I, I shouldn't say it's bad. Um, you know, when, when bad things happen, you feel rotten. So that's how it was. Um, but little by little, I realized, you know what, you know, it's cool about this place and these people who greet each other and have big smiles and, you know, talk about things other than the people that they lost to suicide is that these people, um, while they still grieve for their person, you know, there's hope in my, for me, because look at all these people that they have happiness. They have normal relationships. They have friendships. They have somebody that they care to know, you know, how their trip went between the monthly meetings. And so one of the people that I met at those meetings, um, she's a tremendous helper, uh, especially of those people, those, those of us ladies who've lost husbands to suicide. Um, she introduced me to um, some other ladies who had also lost their husbands to suicide. That was, uh, I guess, about five years ago now. And um, we all became really good friends. I mean, we travel together. We, we do a holiday party together every year um, now with us. And in fact, almost everybody has a significant other. So, you know, now the, the new kind of groups of people are included. Um, our kids are all friends. So it gives them a, a, a bit of a community right? So um, my kids were the youngest in this particular small group. I mean, there's only five of us, right? So it's not, it's not a lot of people. Um, but my kids are, are significantly younger than the others. But what's really kind of amazing about uh, what we call ourselves the widow warriors um, is that, you know, when my kids have questions about or start feeling or express that they think they're the only people without a dad. Um, first of all, there's lots of reasons, unfortunately, in the world that, that kids don't have dads. Um, but even specifically having lost their father to suicide, I have examples and people that they know that I can say, hey, listen, you know, you know this other kid? His dad also, you know, died by suicide. Um, and, and another thing that's, I think, important to know um, is that in our group, um, it's very much a awareness about, you know, we all care about suicide prevention very much. We, you know, um, participate in, in things that are walks and things that are about suicide prevention. Um, and at least for me, I've been honest with my kids about um, the fact that their dad died by suicide. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that because that's something that I get a lot of questions on. People ask me on forums and sometimes just in my own personal life, you know, well, what did you say to your kids? <clears throat> so I don't think it's a single conversation. Um, it certainly wasn't for me. It was not a single conversation when my children were three and a half and, and an infant, right? Um, so the conversations for us perhaps are a little different than they would have been for someone else with older kids. But I, um, I did a lot of reading and a lot of research. And, you know, at the time, and I think this is still holding true mostly, the... Um, the, the academic community basically said, tell your kids the truth. Don't tell them a lie because if you lie to them, it does not change the fact that they've lost a parent. And in fact, when they're older and they find out the truth, because they inevitably will, they will feel like you lied to them. And breaking that trust when they already have a lot of complex or, or likely have a lot of complex uh, emotions about losing a parent anyway. And then they find out after the fact it was to suicide. And then they find out or they put two and two together and lose trust with you. That can be 
very damaging. And um, you know, back to my priorities about stability and happiness, uh, I don't think that you know hiding the truth uh, creates stability nor happiness. So we've had conversations that um, Travis died by suicide. Um, and I think that one of the things to note is it's very important when you have those conversations to be prepared for questions and to be prepared to answer them in an age appropriate way. So this is not, I am not advocating at all giving really anyone graphic details of the manner or the loss um, exactly how it happened, right? That's, that's not the point. Um, for my kids, when they were young, really young, um, the way that I explain it was that uh, their dad died because his brain was sick. <clears throat> and that, you know, is a viable um, way to explain so the, the severe depression and mental illness that was happening with Travis. Um, as, as they got older, especially as my daughter got older, she's now 11, um, you know, <clears throat> she wanted to know more. And that, that phrase actually became a little bit of a problem for us because she started assuming he had brain cancer. And so she said, so, did dad have brain cancer? And then she started saying, am, am I at risk for brain cancer because dad had brain cancer? And I said, what are you talking about? Why would you even think that? And then she told me and I said, no, we, we have to have a more, you know, blunt conversation. First of all, your dad never had brain cancer. He had um, severe depression and she didn't really exactly understand what that meant because I think some of that's a bit about you know, people will say, oh, how was your day? Oh, I'm depressed, I'm bummed out. Bummed out is not the same as depression. Clinical depression is very, very different. And so um, we had conversations about that. So as you can hopefully tell, what I try to do is build the story and build the narrative in a way that, that they're minds can make connections and not jump to assumptions because um i think we can all as adults can we can be very surprised by what our kids can assume and so in my opinion it it's been better for us definitely for me to make sure that we have open and honest conversations I also think it's important, and maybe I'm crazy, I'm one of those people who started thinking about, well, what age should we go to kindergarten because I, how old are you gonna be the first year you go to college? So I'm probably more of a planner than most, it's fine. Um, but I also think about that, you know, if when we hit some of the harder middle school and teen years and college years and when life really you know, kind of smacks my kids around. I want to make sure that they have a couple of tools. One is that they understand that, you know, mental illness is a serious situation um, that has definitely impacted our family. Um, so that's a piece of medical history I think that they should understand, you know, um, not unlike heart disease or um, you know, diabetes or, or issues with your kidneys. If, if there are things that are happening um, you know, that, that are impacting their mental wellness, they should have the advantage of being able to tell their doctor or work with their mom to know that that's something that has been a serious impact in their life. That's one thing, that's just purely from a facts-based conversation. Then the other thing, is, um, you know, I, I want to work hard for them to understand that there, there are coping mechanisms and there are things that we can work on and we can do to create mental wellness. I very sincerely hope that neither of my children are ever gripped by the, the beast that is depression. But if they are, I will help them.
And I want them to know that that help exists. And I want them to know that it can be very successful. And I, um, you know, want them to know that you should ask for help and that there, that this is not something that we hide in the background and never talk about. Um, because I don't want them to feel ashamed about anything. And, and like I said, if they ever need help, I want them to be able to come uh, and ask for it and do that from a, a place of, you know, um, understanding that they'll be supported. So those are kind of the, the main things um, from me. I, Marilyn or Susan, did, did you have any other questions you wanted me to talk through? I mean, those are, that's my high level story. I don't know if we have any questions coming in. Is there any, any questions so far, Susan? No, no questions so far. Um, so you did mention, did you touch on coping strategies that have worked for? Oh, no, I don't think I did. Okay. Okay, so um, some things that helped me uh, in, in particular, let's see. Um, well, first of all, uh, I had to really be honest with myself about feeling angry. That was, that was the first thing. So, um, and I had to fix my sleep. So with a, with a newborn and a very traumatic event that happened in my life, uh, you can imagine I wasn't sleeping, um, well at all, uh, or, or at all and no sleep coupled with that anger was not a good situation. So, um, for me, the right thing to do was to go to my doctor and I, I was uh, put on a low dose of an antidepressant um, for about a year and a half. Um, it wasn't forever, but it's what I needed to have at the time to sort of just take that you know, edge down. Um, I, I had a therapist who described, because I was angry and then I couldn't figure, then I would get more angry because I was angry. Does that make sense? Um, you know, it doesn't make sense, but it's how it worked. And so this is what she described to me. This is probably not a good illustration because my cup is almost empty. But if you think about, um, you know, your capacity for emotion, she told me, listen, you know, the emotions you have going on in your life are like, imagine that this is full. It's, it's here, right? It's right at that very edge at the top. And so if, if like one more little thing happens, someone cuts you off in traffic, let's say, or in my case, um, you know, uh, the daycare said, we ran out of diapers for your son. Sorry, we forgot to tell you. There's only one diaper left. You're going to have to go buy diapers for him to stay here today, even though they had 300 kids there. That's, that was a real situation, super stupid and annoying, but really just annoying, right? That would make me just so angry. So the way that she described it to me was like, hey, listen, you're all the way full here. So that one little thing happens, drop, drop in there, and it causes it all to overflow. So we started, so that was a good visualization for me. So we started working on making sure that I wasn't operating at this like level of not even one more drop could happen. And, and those things happen with, um, you know, uh, sleep, exercise, you know, getting the endorphins in your body. I didn't, I didn't do a lot of exercise. Um, it was just as simple as, you know, in early days, make sure you get out of your house and see the sun every day. And then I also learned, I think, a technique that I use in lots of things. I use it in parenting. I use it at work now. I use it for myself. Um, I started writing down what, what would be considered the small wins. So I didn't have to become, you know, myself again overnight. Um, I just needed to, like, be like, took a shower today. Woohoo, you know? Um, Went outside, took the baby, the, the babies, two of them, on a walk with the stroller. 
I think almost any new parent would tell you that's almost a feat unto itself anyway. Um, and I started kind of taking credit for some of those things that were accomplishments that worked out really, really well. I, I use that today, you know, um, when my daughter, my daughter plays basketball now um, on a sixth grade team. And there was a game this year that the end of game score was six to four. They played two 20 minute halves and the score was six to four. And so, um, you know, I learned those techniques of saying, hey, you know, what I really liked was that you ran up and down that court every single time. You really hustled. I really liked your pass. It wasn't necessarily about like, did you make 10 baskets? By the way, nobody made 10 baskets. It was about being out there and being a part of it and, and doing that. And so praising those things both for others and yourself was a really good technique for me. Um, and then there was a couple of other things, you know, uh, around um, kid stuff. First of all, uh, at school, at soccer games, um, you know, sports teams. Again, I, I said earlier, I don't, I don't hide the fact, um, you know, that I'm doing this on my own, and that helps. You know, um, when you have kids, and it's it's good for people to know that you're what I call an only parent. Um, it's very different. The, the people who I've met and, and gotten a little irritated with are those people who say, well, yeah, you know, I was recently divorced. I'm a single parent too. I was like, oh, really? You know, is, um, your, your child's dad's not in the picture. Oh, well, you know, he only takes them like every other week. Okay, that's not the same thing as those of us who are only parents. Um, men or women, it does not matter. It, it's a different situation where you are the person that is, has to be 100% responsible for these, you know, little lives. Um, another thing that I did, this is a very practical thing. I made sure that my affairs were in order. That means my life insurance. That means uh, that my life insurance was balanced correctly to take care of my children if anything happened to me. I also made sure that um, I have a, a, a will, which is, you know, not just written on a piece of paper and, you know, put in an envelope by my bedside table, but actually um, legal and executed. And it has actually four levels of priority one, two, three, four, like if available, if available, if available, if available. Those are the ways that I could sleep at night. Um, I knew for sure that my kids were taken care of. And that, and that again, was, was super important. Um, so I think those are, are kind of my top ones. Yeah, Susan, you have some questions? Yeah, we've got a bunch of questions. So uh, one of the questions Anne asks, and this was something you and I have talked about in the past, how do you share memories with your children of their father, uh, particularly if they're too young to remember him? Ah, that's a good one. So um, I strive to make it natural, right? So um, the other day we were uh, we were we were kind of flipping through uh, the channels, and um, some stuff was happening with baseball with spring training, and I said, "Oh, do, you know, do you, you guys know your dad was a, a pretty big baseball fan?" And they were like, "Yeah, you know." And um, so that's just kind of casual and we could just sort of let that go. But it's an opportunity, I think, to help them create their own picture of their dad in their mind. So, I, so then I expanded on it and said, you know, before you guys were born, your dad and I would go to spring training every year. That was the trip we made. So we would go to Arizona and we would do blah, 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 blah. And like, here's sort of a little funny story. Um, I try to paint some of those pictures for them. Um, for Cameron, my, my son, um, 
really, really difficult for him because he has, of course, no memory of his dad because he was so young. Um, what's interesting though is he will kind of, he will be able to tell you about his dad, right? Because he's got a picture in his brain. Um, my daughter, Annie, she, um, she went through a time that was very hard because she realized she was forgetting him. That was heartbreaking, right? Um, but if you think on it, there, there are hardly any memories any adult has, as far as anyone I've ever spoken to, that they really have a solid, solid memory from when they were about three years old. And so that was the time period, you know, for her to have remembered her dad. So immediately after he died for, you know, a couple of years, she would be able to articulate and talk about um, memories and things that, you know, she and dad did. And I remember when we did this or when I rode the bike, you know, in the basket with him or that. And then there was a time when she was about seven or maybe eight when um, she was having a really tough time and I, I couldn't really figure it out. And so we talked about it and um, she just broke down and said, you know, I'm forgetting him. And so at that point, that's where we got up the pictures and we started looking through some of it. Um, and, and it's really hard. So, you know, you have to kind of make a decision to do it. And, and at least for me, because it's still hard, it's important to me that they get an idea and a picture of what their dad likes. So I try to make it around like um, everyday kind of stuff. Like, did you know he loved ice cream? Oh my God, did that man love ice cream? Like he loved ice cream in a bowl this big, right? Not just like, oh, your dad's favorite kind was chocolate you know, but to tell a bit of a story, um, that seems to have helped versus it being so traumatic, um, you know, getting out like the picture book or the laptop and going through all the photos. And part of that is because I get upset, right? Um, I get sad and disappointed and, you know, I'm sad that my kids don't have their dad here. I really am. And w one of the things that I think people should be conscious of and decide to do with it, you know, what's best for you is sometimes then your kids end up taking care of you or being so worried about you that, that they don't, you know, talk about things the same way or it can have an unintended consequence. So I try to be very careful about, you know, being authentic. Of course, I'm sad that your dad's not here anymore. Of course I am. But we should still talk about him because he was a great guy and you should know who he was, right? Um, and the other thing that I do, and then maybe we'll go to the next question, is, um, you know, with kids, I, I sometimes see traits that are similar to their dad. And I, you know, and I call that out, I, like, you know, wow, Cameron, you're really fast. Your dad was also a really good athlete. Like, I bet that that comes from him because it doesn't come from me. You know, those kinds of comments make him a real person for them and, and provide a connection. So that's what I try to do. That's a great, great um, story and real life, a story of real life, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. We have another question and this, this is going to be for all of us, uh, Marilyn and Kelly, because we're, we've got, some years behind us, uh, you know, in our grief work. It's one that we've talked about before, and Marilyn, this may be one that you would like to, to answer. So we have a person that asks, asks the question about the suicide note. Uh, she, she hasn't read it, and the family wants it. They're looking for answers. Will any good come from us reading this? So think about that for a second, and I'll share with you what someone had shared in one of our Carmichael meetings. She answered, somebody asked that question, or they, the person actually said they had the note. They had a note. And so this person, this woman whose husband had taken his own life, she said the note did absolute, answered no questions. It didn't do any good because it was just a continuation on of the mental illness that had just 
tortured her poor husband. It was just kind of a continuation on of that. This person wasn't who we knew to be at that moment when they wrote the note. I guess that's the best way to say it. So um, it, it didn't, it didn't, it was just the same. It really didn't do, didn't really help with the healing. So Marilyn, what's your thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, my son, uh, he was 18 years old when he died and he was much of a perfectionist and he did write notes. In fact, he wrote seven notes. He wrote notes to the police, he wrote notes to a girl he'd had one date with, his, to his brother, to the family, to the person he was giving his golf clubs to, and, and you know, went on. Um, the one to the family, um, the first of all, most people aren't going to get notes. Mm -hmm. And so if you didn't get a note, that's that's more common than not. Um, so what, what I, if talking to people and learning a lot about it, um, for most people, um, I must caution you, I would not read it by myself. Mm -hmm. And I would not also read the, the, the uh, police report by yourself. I would have somebody with me if you've got, if you haven't read it yet, sometimes we, you know, we put it aside because we're afraid of what it says. Um, I have heard before about them just going on and on and on about how miserable they are or blaming people or whatever. But like uh, um, Susan said, often it's not, it's not real. It's not realistic. And my son's note uh, didn't, well, it only gave us one, one sentence or well, two sentences. Um, he, he just was like, um, I mean, it's like, give this to whom, whatever, it was very businesslike. But then he said, this is no one's fault. Uh, I just don't have any future. Now, <clears throat> that was what he was thinking, but that was not the reality of a person that got um, super great grades and was going to high school and college at the same time and who never did drugs or anything else. How could you not have a future? You even had decided to be a criminologist. So... I got that little, little sliver of what was going on in his head because we were totally blindsided by his, by his death. We had no, no clues ahead of time. He never told anybody. We had no idea. So um, some notes might give you an answer, but the thing is, it's, it's from their perspective and they are, they are desperate when they kill themselves. So they, they, right their desperation or their illness and for the most part we are trying to understand it an irrational act with a rational mind and if you take my son's um note um that wasn't a rational thought it wasn't the rational that wasn't life that wasn't his life so we we most times most families find that even if you find that sliver, you still can't, it still, for us, does not justify what happened. It's like, but that's not a good enough reason to kill yourself. That's not enough reason because you had these other options. And so it's, it'll never be a good enough reason for us because we wanted a different outcome. Don't like this outcome I've got. But, um, you know, it's, it's part of our heritage and now it becomes part of our heritage. So, but I would be careful about who I share with and who I talk to. And you might want to talk to a therapist first about and go over it with them or read it with a therapist to try to get some interpretation. Be real careful with it uh, from your standpoint. So it doesn't overwhelm you. Um, but so you're not by yourself, I would say. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not the cure-all for finding out why it is not, unfortunately. I think there's a, a second part of the question we should also potentially address. Um, so I, I agree with, with what both Susan and, and Marilyn shared there um, about the note itself. But the, question, the part of the question I'm intrigued by is, you know, the, the piece there about the, the family wants you to, right? So here's my take. You are potentially in survival mode in your own brain or, or deep trauma or deep grief or 
all of those things together. Um, in my particular situation, because I had that clarity about stability and happiness, when really off the wall things came to my door from his family, I created some pretty big boundaries and I have no regrets about that. You have to do what is going to be healthy and right for those of you who are still here. Um, and that is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And that sometimes means telling people that they don't just get access to whatever they want. In, in my case, you know, um, some of the very unstable and unhealthy behaviors that were coming from my late husband's siblings means that we don't have contact with them anymore. And that is, you know, some people would say a great tragedy and difficulty. My perspective is very different. My perspective is my kids need stability. They don't need somebody who, you know, does very dangerous, unsafe, unpredictable things around them. They don't need that kind of drama. They've already had the rottenness sort of hit them in life. And I will do whatever I need to do to make sure that none of that that's preventable comes back in. So I just think that you need to sometimes give yourself permission to not give everyone access just because they want it. That's, um, well, that's well said, Kelly. That, that's a really that's, and that's so true. Very true. Yeah. Any other more questions? Um, let's see. I, I was curious, Kelly, <clears throat> Travis's family, were they close by? Were they local, your uh, husband? Um, uh, yes and no. So there were all kinds of um, siblings. He, he was from a family, a blended family, you know. So for his funeral, there were siblings who showed up who I had never seen before. Um, it was kind of them to actually come in from out of state. And those are the siblings I am still in contact with. You know, they put their actions um, out there uh, as, as supportive people. And, and I don't mean that they had to do anything for us. Mm -hmm. I mean that they showed up and grieved their brother. Um, his other siblings that are local in California, um, California is a big state, but but they're all within driving distance. There are four within driving distance, and we have a relationship with one of them. Oh, okay. Uh, the others, I explicitly um, had to say, you know what? We we don't. With two of his brothers, we just never really had much of a connection with them. Anyway, they, they came from a very unhealthy. Um, they just had a rotten, bad childhood. I mean, they did. Yeah. And um, I can't, I can't lie and pretend like it was, it was great and fine. Um, that, that, I don't think that's healthy and right. You don't have to confront it all the time either. You don't have to always bring it up, but, but just pretending it's not there. No, that's no good. And then his, his, one of his sisters um, is local and really pushed the boundaries of what was appropriate, meaning, you know, she would show up at my house sort of at all hours, sometimes sober, sometimes not, um, sit at the kitchen counter and just wail, you know, for like two and three hours. And I, and I sort of hit the point where I was like, you know what, you do need professional help and I hope you get it, but it's, it's not from me and this cannot be my burden and you cannot bring this into my house. I have a, I have a three and a half year old who was happy. You know, the, the good thing about little kids is they still bring a lot of joy into your life and, and wonder and all those great things. We can't have this in our space. Mm -hmm. um, and that, as you can imagine, was not well received. And so 
we don't have a relationship and um, my kids don't know the difference. And again, when I look at that just sort of clinically, if I remove my own emotion and maybe my own sort of second guessing what I do, if I, if I weigh it out as, are my children's lives better or worse because of the decision I made? I confidently can say that their lives are better. Sometimes it's like, you know, it, it's a push, like it's, un, it's unknown. Maybe, maybe in, uh, to be very honest, it's easier for me. So, so maybe that's it. Kind of like if we were talking about the photos, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have, by the way, I do have pictures of Travis in my house. We moved houses. Um, his pictures are in the house when we have school projects that are like, build your family tree. I hate that school project, but you know what? We build the family tree, we put Travis's picture on it. It's unfortunate because then every single time my kid has to explain in front of the new class that his dad is dead or her dad is dead. And those are hard things to get confronted with over and over again. But I'll tell you what, they can do it. The first time it happened, I was really unexpected and I hate back to school night. Cause I, you know, you go to back to school night and then you have the parent teacher conference like the next week. And every year I sit down with two new people and I explain to them, hey, I want you to know what's going on, what, what our family situation is and you need to know this. And I hate having to have that conversation. But honestly, every time you have the conversation, it becomes more straightforward to have the next time and it increases the pool of support for my kids. Mm -hmm. so every time I will have that conversation, no matter if I hate doing it or not. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think if you're struggling with trying to figure out, you know, if you have kids, my biggest piece of advice is to spend some time with yourself to figure out what your priorities are and then line up your decisions that you make because now you're the person who has to make all the decisions that can be sort of overwhelming at first too um and so you you know where your priority is so all of your decisions you make line up to that priority it, it, it makes you more confident and i think it it helps your family yeah so do we have a lot of questions, Susan? Yeah, we have a, a couple more. Um, and one, um, Alicia wrote that um, she lost her husband. Well, her husband passed just a little over a year ago, and she has four children under the age of six years old. So, Marilyn, um, I don't know if people know, you've had, you have, how many, you had, I can't remember, you always say it and I forget. Stephen, seven was, children. You have seven children, but you had how many under? No, I had a two and a half year old who does yep. not remember his brother. And the next one was up as 12 years old. Um, I was just thinking if there's several questions, if you wanted to email those to the office, um, to us, we could forward them to Kelly. Oh yeah, no, I'll take care of, we've answered everything yep. so far. Yep. Answer them all, okay. Yeah, the thing, the thing with Alicia with the four children under six years old, I the only thing I can say is, like Kelly has talked about, is really kind of start, building your support system, you know, whatever that is. And I think if, I don't know, Alicia, if you have people that can, that, you know, like Kelly's, Kelly's mom is like amazing. I love her. <laughs> she is like, she's kind of a force to be reckoned with. She is yeah. amazing. I love her so much. Yeah, I'm she cool. is. And so, she, I, my the one comment though, with, with the children, make sure mm -hmm. that the people around them, mm -hmm. you all have the same story yeah. And make sure that there, if like Kelly being very honest, that if there are people in the family, extended family, that don't, um, I mean, there's been times when I've heard stories about, well, we don't want to tell the kids it's, you know, they, they're too young and blah, blah, blah. But make sure the people that are helping you babysit or whatever know your desires as far as what they should talk about. And yeah, good point. make it clear that maybe you only want them to come back and ask you those questions, uh, you as a mother, instead of asking grandma or grandpa or whatever, 
Um, sometimes grandparents have been muzzled and not allowed to talk about it. And yet they want to, and the parents don't want them to. So kind of flush that out. So your kids aren't torn from one side to the other or get half truths or, you know, you want a solid story like Kelly has, has designed for her children mm -hmm. and the honest straight story, but within the limits of their age and everything. So uh, make sure the kids don't get in, enmeshed in some kind of conflict, but that's the reason why you need to say the truth. Right. I like what Kelly said too. I want to make sure we drive that point home that just because people, just because this person may be your kid's aunt doesn't mean she gets to show up no. at two in the morning. You know, that, no, just be, that, no. Uh, well, I can't remember exactly how you said it, Kelly. You articulated so perfectly. I think that, it's just you need to have boundaries. It's a boundary thing. So, and you're the boss. Yeah. So, Alicia, you're the boss. And yeah. if people don't like it, you know, I, tough. I mean, that's kind of what I say. I, you know, I don't apologize. I just say, you know what, this is how it is. This is how it is because. But, you know, in some families, there is a lot of dysfunction, as you mentioned. Uh, certainly, I had plenty of it. I've had to experience some of that. And, you know, I look at Kelly and she's breaking that cycle of dysfunction for her children. Thank so you. They don't end up having all that dysfunction but a lot of times the dysfunction comes from depression that is just in the family and years ago people would drink instead of they didn't understand it they didn't understand depression now we have better um, coping skills we have therapists we have more understanding of depression and the connection to alcohol or drugs so it's time that we all make the effort to break that cycle so our children have a better life than what parents or grandparents had or aunts and uncles. And it also means the boundaries of staying away from some people and not, not, be, you know, not having them an active part of your life. Right. That's just this wise thing to do. It is. So on that note, we've come to eight o'clock. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing. That was just so insightful. And your kids are amazing. I just love your kids. They're so wonderful. Thank you. They're funny little people. They so are funny little people. Crazy. I hope that this uh, has been helpful for everyone who participated. Thank you for listening to me talk for a long time. Um, if you have specific questions, as Marilyn and Susan both said, if you email the office, the info at friendsforsurvival.org, um, they'll get me the questions. I can, you know, respond directly to you or, or, you know, we can get you more information from the, the office as well. We have a lot of good support materials and things that, that you might find helpful. Um, and if the webinar was good for you, tell people so that we can um, keep doing them. I, I, I'm happy to keep doing them as long as they're useful to folks. So thank you very much. Thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank good night. you.